All right, welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started with our chapter one um, PowerPoint here. Um, this is basically uh, a brief history of and an introduction to the emergency medical services system or EMS. Um, so let me start sharing my screen here. All right. All right, so here's the beginning of EMS. So um, one thing you should know um, is that most advances in EMS start uh, with, um, they happen on the battlefield. Um, emergency medicine um, always takes great advances when there is fighting, there's war, things like that. And um, the beginning of EMS was no different. Uh, it started in the 1790s during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, normally what would happen in war and fighting uh, to begin with uh, before this point was you were a soldier and you got shot or hurt, you were there on the battlefield and you laid there until uh, it was over. Um, sometimes it was uh, the townsfolk around who would come afterwards or were safe to, um, to help the soldiers that had fallen um, obviously, the soldiers themselves afterwards would help uh, their compatriots. Um, but most of the time, once you were down, you were down until it was over. So in the Napoleonic Wars, what they first started doing was dragging these guys off the battlefield uh, behind the front lines so they could get care from physicians. So that's where it first started. Um, a big leap in that uh, in the United States happened during the Civil War um, uh, in the 1860s. When Clara Barton, um, American hero Clara Barton, let me clarify there, um, uh, when she and her nurses started uh, attending to the wounded on the battlefield, dragging them off of the battlefield and getting them to help um, as quickly as possible. Um, and then there were more advances later on in World War I. Um, they had ambulance corps, so people would volunteer to drive ambulances to be basically the medics. They would drag people off of the battlefield, or soldiers would drag people off of the battlefield to a place of safety. The ambulance crews would pick them up and then drive them back behind the front lines so uh, they could get care from physicians at field hospitals uh, behind there. Um, so it's a little bit different than, uh, it was definitely different than getting care like where you got hurt, which is what happens today. <clears throat> um, another big advancement in EMS, um, uh, on the battlefield especially was when um, you know, uh, different vehicles were introduced. So helicopters, uh, motorized vehicles, you gotta remember 1790s, 1860s, there weren't, there weren't any ambulances. These were uh, people being dragged off on cots. Um, they might throw them in a wagon, a horse drawn wagon, and that takes, takes them back to the, the field hospital or whatnot. But um, big advancements were made with the invention uh, and use of the helicopter uh, in uh, wartime. Uh, in this picture, you can see um, a helicopter used during the Korean War. And there's two pods on each side. There's a pod on each side. That's where a patient would go. They would come down, they could take two patients, and then they would fly them back behind the front lines as quickly as possible um, to get that soldier uh, help at their uh, MASH style hospital units. These were mobile army um, field hospitals that they would set up. So they would get them as quickly as possible um, uh, from the battlefield to definitive help, to the operating table to get, to get help. And just this uh, shrinking down the time from when they got hurt to when they get uh, to actually getting help um, from a physician, from a surgeon, uh, shrinking that time down greatly increased um, the chances that a soldier would survive the wounds um, rather than succumb to them. Um, so that was a big advancement there. Obviously one that we still use today, we fly people all the time. Um, so how it began in civilian life, uh, was in the early 1900s, um, non-military ambulance uh, services began operating. Now. A lot of ambulance services were operated by hospitals, fire departments, and even funeral homes um, there. Now, you got to understand these ambulances that they used um, might just be a car. 
right? Might be, just be like a little pickup truck that could throw somebody in the back. No care was actually being done on scene or on the way. They would just transport them. Now, some of this could get a little sketchy, as I'm sure you can imagine, if you are a, um, a funeral home director, and maybe you don't get uh, to the hospital so quick, or you take your time on scene a little bit, and well, instead of getting somebody to the hospital as a patient, you might have a new client for your funeral home. So things were a little bit sketchy back then. There weren't any requirements. There was no standardization for care. Um, there was no rules about what an ambulance had to be or um, you know, any training that anybody that had to be on there uh, needed to be. There was, there was no regulation for any of that. It was you know, kind of like the wild, wild west uh, in that regards. Now, today, uh, it's obviously a lot different. Um, in 1966, the U.S. government decided that we needed a national plan for um, EMS health care. And so the Department of Transportation was charged with developing EMS standards. Um, and uh, these became national standards. So what it meant to be an EMT, what it meant to uh, be, have an ambulance, what should go inside of an ambulance, what were its capacities supposed to be. Um, uh, so the Department of Transportation, uh, again, made made that possible. They, they came up with the rules and regulations and they're still uh, in charge of that today. In 1970, uh, the National Registry of EMTs was founded, the uh, NREMT. Um, hopefully you will all become members uh, of the National Registry um, at the end of the year after your certification exam. What the National Registry provides is a uh, nationwide standard for training um, and EMTs helps with reciprocity. Um, I believe it's uh, 46 out of the 50 states um, recognize National Registry. And Virginia is one of those. So if you got your EMT in Virginia and you're nationally registered, you can go to California and be an EMT out there. It's basically the same rules and regulations, right? So there may be a couple things different uh, locally, but you can go from one place to another. So if you get your EMT here, in Virginia, and you want to go uh, live in Hawaii and be an EMT out there, um, National Registry can, can help you do that. Um, in 1973, the National Emergency Medical Service System Act was passed uh, by Congress. Um, this is just another jump start in getting um, standards of training, um, their funding, helping uh, states fund uh, their, uh, their EMS systems uh, locally. So, uh, and this, this uh, fell on NHTSA. NHTSA is the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration. It's part of the Department of Transportation. Um, and so they started to um, make more regulations and policy. Uh, they basically said that each state's gonna establish their own laws, uh, and policies and, and regulations, but they're gonna kind of follow this national format. Um, they wanted, uh, to help with resource management as well. So um, there was a centralized coordination of emergency treatment and transportation services. What that means is that um, uh, all the equipment that's gonna be on your ambulance is gonna be the equipment that's on somebody else's ambulance. All the training that you've had as an EMT is all the training that this other person at another place is gonna have as an EMT as well. So they kind of centralized and coordinated things um, uh, to make it easier um, to provide and get care. Um, again, uh, human resources training ensures that all EMS personnel are trained, certified to minimum standards. Like the class that we're going to take, it's a uh, it's a national curriculum that's been approved by Virginia for use here. So, basically, taking the same class as somebody in like Utah, or Wyoming, something like that. Um, so the human resources and training that set standards and regulations for those, and then transportation, uh, as we said, as well. Um, what does it mean to, uh, what should an ambulance have inside of it? What uh, is the actual vehicle supposed to look like? What kind of training do you need to drive one of these things? Um, uh, and where do, you, where do you take your patient? Uh, do you take them to the nearest hospital? Do you take them to somewhere far away, further away? Like, what's the deal? So they, they uh, NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, part of DOT, 
um, laid out these rules and regulations uh, there. Um, so uh, again, more rules uh, there for transportation, and then they also helped set up the universal um, 911 system. It's a number that we can access anywhere in the country um, to call for emergency help. Um, they also help regulate the communication from uh, 911 to ambulances, from ambulance to ambulance, from ambulance to hospitals. Um, all the communications that are involved with EMS and it's a help lay out the groundwork for that as well. Uh, there's also other regulations uh, that NHTSA provided, so public information and education. So, um, you know, what good is EMS if the public doesn't know how to use it? Hey, you know, we're no good if the people don't know how to get in touch with us, right? So, we have uh, part of our role in EMS is educating the public, making sure that they have access to EMS, and then participate in injury prevention programs, um, uh, things like that. It also stated that we need a medical director. So um, in every EMS system, every local system, like for example, our system here um, in the central Shenandoah um, uh, region, we have a medical director. The medical director approves all of our protocols, all of the things that we can and can't do in an ambulance as an EMT or as an advanced EMT or as a paramedic. They set the kind of the rules for us. There. So the medical director is in charge of um, the local uh, EMS systems. So again, uh, we have one, and who you'll meet, Dr. Asher Brand. We'll meet him uh, this year. He'll be coming in to, to check out our class. Um, NHTSA also developed trauma systems. Um, so trauma triage, transport, and treatment protocols. Um, uh, so basically, this setup. Um, trauma hospitals, uh, specifically for really bad traumas. So there's level one traumas, level two trauma hospitals, level three trauma hospitals, and they have, all have different capabilities. Um, and so they've, they've made the rules for how those are supposed to um, uh, come into play in local EMS systems. There's also, uh, there was an establishment for quality improvement and quality assurance, QI or QA there, um, to improve our effectiveness, right? So um, we are, obligated to look at uh, hard facts and science to see what works best for our patients. Um, and so it's uh, helped establish that as well. Now let's look at the components of the EMS system. Um, there's four major components to the EMS uh, uh, system. First is going to be the emergency medical dispatchers. And this is the first point of contact that the public has with EMS. And when they contact EMS, this is where um, uh, care actually begins when, uh, for a patient, when they get in touch with the emergency medical dispatchers, the 911 operators. 911 operators obviously take the call and then they, uh, they send us out, right? Um, they, they let us know at our rescue squads that we are, uh, we have a patient somewhere and then we need to go get them. So we have the EMDs or the emergency medical dispatchers. We have the EMS responders. So that's your EMTs, your paramedics, et cetera. And then there's the emergency department and hospital personnel. So these are our um, allied healthcare personnel, our doctors, our nurses, our radiologists, uh, um, uh, you know, all, all those folks uh, that work at the hospital in the emergency rooms uh, uh, using their expertise to provide care. They're part of the allied health personnel. And they're part of the EMS system also. And then we have specialty centers. Um, specialty centers, uh, they're not exactly like a regular hospital. For example, I think the easiest way to understand it is that there are hospitals that are just for burn patients. That's a specialty type center. Um, we mentioned another one already, trauma center. So when somebody has a specific uh, type or level of trauma, they can go um, to these hospitals that are specifically built to handle those uh, patient cases. So those are our four big components of the EMS system. We have our emergency medical dispatchers, our EMS responders, our hospital personnel, our emergency department personnel, uh, and the specialty centers. So we need to know each of those. <coughs> um, here's a, a look at some of the specialty centers that uh, are out there. So we have trauma centers, burn centers, stroke centers, cardiac centers, and pediatric centers. Um, now, most hospitals nowadays 
uh, or a lot of them, uh, I'm sure within the next you know, 20 years, um, that all hospitals are going to be cardiac and stroke centers, probably save for um, hospitals that are very rural and uh, lower funded, things like that. Um, you may not have those. So, like for example, Augusta Health, it's not a trauma center. You can go there if you've broken your arm or something, but if you've had a large trauma or your head injury, spinal injury, things like that, you're not going to Augusta Health. Um, but you can go to Augusta Health for, because it, it is a cardiac center. You can go to take patients there when they're having heart attacks and they can, they can take care of them uh, there, those specific types. So those are our, um, some of the specialty centers. There are uh, other ones out there as well, and then we'll talk about that. So let's think about this real quick. What medical services are available in your community? Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, uh, if you were to get hurt where you live, uh, are your EMS providers, are they able to call in a helicopter to take you uh, to the hospital or a specialty center that might be far away? Yeah, definitely. We definitely have that. Um, how important do you think it is to know what the capabilities are of your local hospitals? Let's say, for example, you have a heart attack patient. And you're not sure which hospital is a cardiac center. You don't know if Augusta Health is a cardiac center. Uh, does that hurt your patient if you don't know those? Absolutely. So we got to know where our local specialty centers are in order to make the correct decisions on transporting people to the hospital. Um, so what do you think about this one, this last question? What are the possible consequences of transporting a patient to a facility not equipped to handle the problem? What if we take a heart attack patient to a hospital that is not a cardiac center? What problems do you think could arise from that? Well, a big one is maybe the patient dies. That's that's a pretty, pretty big problem if you take them to the wrong place. So um, you got to know the capabilities. Um, of our community medical services, what do we have to offer to our patients uh, in this community? So how do we access EMS system? Uh, it's, it's normally uh, a phone call. A uh, phone call is normally what activates us. So 911, uh, 911, um, uh, is our phone number, a universal phone number. It's available in most communities. There are communities that are very, very rural um, and they don't have access to it. And so they may have to call actually their local hospital who may have EMTs in their own ambulances to, to send them out. Um, now what's, what is spreading throughout the country with 911 is enhanced 911. Um, and it provides, uh, if you're calling from a landline telephone, uh, it provides the phone number and physical address of where the patient is. So let's say a patient's having trouble breathing, they feel like they're gonna pass out, they call 911 like, oh, I'm having trouble breathing. I'm going to pass out. And then they pass out before they're able to tell 911 where they are. Well, 911 now knows where they are because uh, if they've used a landline, uh, because it gives them their physical address and their telephone number should they need to call back or if go there without the patient being able to respond. Uh, so enhanced 911 uh, saved a lot of lives for sure. So uh, our first uh, uh, contact for a patient is our EMDs, our emergency medical dispatchers. These are highly trained folks. Um, a lot of uh, municipalities um, say that you have to be an EMT to be an emergency medical dispatcher, which makes sense. Um, you know all about CPR, you know all about uh, you know, assisting with uh, labor and delivery uh, of a baby, uh, you know, uh, other examples like that. So they can maybe walk a patient through these things on the phone should they need to. Um, so they can provide instructions on how to do CPR and, and everything else until the ambulance arrives there. Um, certification in, uh, for EMD is um, required in the vast majority uh, of areas. You have to go through a program to get that as well. And as I said, some places um, require that their EMDs are also EMTs. Uh, critical decision making. This is a topic that we're going to touch on throughout the year, and it's a skill that we're hopefully going to uh, build upon. And so by the time our classes are done, um, 
it's a, it's a sharper tool in your toolbox that you have. It's one of the um, most important tools that we could have as EMTs is making these decisions. Um, it's incredibly important to make smart and right decisions in a timely manner. Uh, we have to gather information, we have to assess our patient, we have to figure out where we're going to treat them or how we're going to, we're going to treat them, where we're going to transport them, um, and all of this has to be done very quickly. Um, uh, decisions are time critical um, a lot of the time, uh, especially with somebody who's in a really bad spot medically or if they've had a traumatic accident and they're in a real bad spot, you got to make decisions quickly and you have to uh, go with those. Um, you can't just sit there like, oh man, I don't know, well, they'll figure it out at the hospital. Well, maybe that person dies before you get to the hospital. And if you had made a good critical uh, decision and you used your critical thinking capabilities uh, beforehand, you could have done something um, prior to that patient expiring. So critical decision making is something that's uh, incredibly important in all aspects of EMS, whether it's the EMD, the EMT, the physician or nurse um, at the hospital. It's, it's incredibly important, probably one of the most important tools you'll have in your toolbox setting. So let's take a couple of examples of critical decisions. Um, is it better to transport a patient to the closest hospital or to one a little further away but it's more appropriate for their condition? All right, so for an example, let's say a patient is in a really bad car wreck. Uh, they're unconscious, there's clearly a head injury uh, there um, and we have two hospitals to choose from. We can go to Augusta Health which is 10 minutes away, okay? But they're not a trauma center. Or you can go all the way to UVA in Charlottesville, right, which may be 40 minutes away, even with driving lights and sirens, right? Is it better to go to Augusta Health or is it better to take this trauma patient to the trauma center over in Charlottesville? Well, normally you might say take it to the the trauma center. Maybe we could fly them to the trauma center. Maybe that's better. But maybe the patient doesn't have a good airway and we need to secure the airway first. So maybe we go to Augusta Health to have them secure the airway and then they get flown to the hospital. So there's a lot of ifs or ands, buts, you know, what if kind of uh, scenarios you can throw in there. So it is a critical decision to going to the right place because if you go to the wrong place, you're wasting one of the uh, valuable things that a patient has, and that's time. So um, make sure that um, you're making those decisions, you're making the right ones. Here's another decision. Um, is the patient good enough where we can take our time on scene at their house, at the scene of the accident? Are they, are they okay? Are they stable enough to do that for us to take our time? Or is this patient in such dire need that we need to load them up into the ambulance and go right now and we'll do all of our work basically on the way to the hospital. That's another decision that you're, you're definitely going to have to make. And here's a, or a simple one. Uh, it's an obvious one. Is the plan that I have to treat this patient, is it going to make them better or is it going to make them worse? Well, fingers crossed that it's always better, but um, you have to take that into account. So. Lots of, uh, lots of decisions um, out there uh, in EMS that you all have to make. Now let's talk about the different levels of EMS. Um, our first level or say lowest level of training is going to be the Emergency Medical Responder or EMR. This level of training is for uh, somebody that's going to be first on scene. Um, a lot of times fire departments, especially rural fire departments, get their firefighters to become EMRs and so if they're first on scene they can take basic care of somebody until the EMT arrives or the paramedic arrives uh, there so emergency medical responder there's the skill set that they need is much smaller than the EMT um, and it's your first basic level of EMS training the next level of EMS training is the EMT the emergency medical uh, technician now we learn lots more than the emergency medical responder does. We learn a lot more. Uh, we have more skills, more knowledge. Our, uh, the depth and breadth of our knowledge is much greater than that of uh, the emergency medical responder. We have all sorts of uh, anatomy and physiology, pathophysiology, uh, skills uh, there that 
again, that the EMR does not even learn. The next step up is the advanced EMT, the advanced emergency medical technician or AEMT. These guys get a few more skills than, than what we do as an EMTs. Um, they, can, uh, they can start IVs, they can push different types of medicine uh, through IVs, uh, things like that, and their training in um, human anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology is a little bit more in depth than ours. And then the last level of EMS training for certification is the paramedic. The paramedic's uh, education is much greater than, um, than any of the certifications listed prior here. EMR, definitely, EMT, absolutely, and AEMT also. Um, it's much more in depth. They have a lot more skills that they can do and they have a lot more medications that they can push um, uh, for the patient. Uh, lots of things, pain relief. Um, cardiac medications, breathing medications, all sorts of things that, that the levels below them can't do. So that's our, our highest level there for EMS is the paramedic. So as an EMT, we've got lots of roles and responsibilities um, there. Um, now I'm going to be making sure throughout the year that, that this point is understood and it's crystal clear to all of you. Your number one priority always on every single call that you go on as an EMT is your personal safety. It's not the patient, it's not your crew, it's your personal safety. You can't help somebody if you get hurt, right? Now, if you get hurt, you need another, more, more people to come in. Um, so your, your personal safety is, is absolutely your first priority on every single call that you go on without exception, it is your first priority. After your personal safety, your next concern is the safety of your crew members. So you gotta make sure that they're okay too. And then the patients. It may seem weird, right? We're out there to help people, but uh, as far as priorities and their safety goes, they're third on the list. That's the way it has to be. We have to protect ourselves, we have to protect our crew, and then we start thinking about the patient. Um, and then any bystanders as well. Um, we can think about their personal safety also. Um, we have to be uh, good at patient assessment. That's one of our responsibilities. We have to assess the patient. We have to figure out what's wrong. We have to play the game, the detective game. What's going on here? We have to figure out the mystery of their traumatic or medical emergency. Um, and then providing patient care. We have to lift and move these people safely maybe out of their homes, into the ambulance, out of the ambulance, into the hospital. Um, we have to transport them safely to the hospital. Um, we have to transfer care. That means we're giving care of the patient to a nurse or a doctor, anybody of higher training, the same or higher training um, than us. And then we have to be advocates for the patient. We have to tell their story correctly to uh, the doctors and nurses at the ER so they know exactly what's going on. Um, we may have to observe uh, their home and let uh, the, the, the doctors uh, know what exactly what transpired in the home in order to give them pay, a good patient care. Uh, for example, uh, had a, uh, an old lady that tripped um, on a throw rug, uh, which uh, uh, is not uncommon, um, and she kind of bounced off a wall and took a turn and went down some stairs. And so her fall, we had to uh, let them know that, hey, these, these things happened. This was the course of events for her to make it down the stairs. Um, but being a patient advocate in the home at that point was taking somebody and gathering up these loose throw rugs that were on the floor and the hallway, bathroom, that kind of thing, and moving them out of the way because they were a, a, a trip hazard. For them. So being a patient advocate um, involves a lot of things. Those are just a couple of the examples there. Here's an example of, of being a patient advocate here. How would it impact an older adult patient, let's say they're elderly, if they were transported to the hospital without their glasses, without their hearing aids, or, or maybe their dentures? You know, that you're kind of, you might blind them or uh, make them deaf uh, when they don't need to be, right? It, make, it might make that, uh, them uncomfortable. It might make them less willing to communicate with us. It may make communicating with our patient extremely difficult if we can't see or hear 
if they have a hard time speaking because they don't have their dentures. And so being a patient advocate can be just be as simple as that, bringing their glasses with them or you know, making sure that they have their hearing aids, things like that. Um, on a routine call, right, there's no massive emergency where we have to go, go, go. We got to get this patient in the ambulance. On a routine call, you're taking the time to gather these things have a negative effect on the patient's care or a positive effect. I think it's going to have a positive effect. If they can feel comfortable and communicate uh, easily, um, then it's going to help them uh, feel more comfortable and it's going to help us do our job a lot better. So yeah, it, it'll have a positive effect. How about making sure their home's locked or the stove is turned off, right? That part of doing those little things, right? Those small kindnesses, uh, going out of your way to do those small things is in fact wonderful patient care. Um, you know, it might not seem like it's medicinal, but it is. And we'll talk about things that may not seem like medicine but, uh, but they are. Um, so like locking a patient's house, making sure that they're comfortable with what's going on, uh, all that, that, that's part of practicing good medicine. <clears throat> so let's talk about physical traits of an EMT. This is a physically demanding job. You have to pick up a lot of people. You gotta pick them up off the floor. You gotta pull them out of a car that's um, flipped over. You, you know, you have to be physical. You might have to, if you don't have the power cots that raise and lower on their own, um, you may have to, um, you know, lift the cots. That's what we have here in the classroom. Um, and we're going to use uh, use that. So you have to be able to lift and carry equipment and patients up to about 125 pounds. Um, obviously, much more with help. Um, you should be able to have good eyesight. Um, that helps to keep yourself safe. Um, and you should be able to, uh, your eyesight should be able to be okay where you can read uh, well. You should have an awareness of problems. Um, if, you have, uh, if you're colorblind, um, you should have good communication skills at a minimum. Hopefully, your uh, communication skills become excellent over time after practicing and, and paying attention to them, um, both oral and written. We're going to be write, writing legal documents. Um, and if you're poor at writing them out, that may hurt you in the, uh, in the long run. So you have to be good at, at, at oral in written communications, it's, it's incredibly important. Uh, here's some personal traits of a, a good EMT, that they're pleasant, they're sincere, they're cooperative, they're resourceful, um, they're good listeners, that could be something else. Um, what do you think would be a good quality, a personal quality of an EMT that's coming to your home to take care of you? I don't want somebody that, that looks professional, that looks the job, right? Like they're there, like they walk into my house, they're in the uniform, it's neat, they're tidy, they're confident uh, in themselves. Um, and so when they walk in the door, through all that nonverbal communication uh, there, I can say, all right, I already trust this guy, or I already trust this lady. Um, they're gonna help. What do you guys think? What do, what is a, what's a good personal trait for an EMT to have? Uh, there's obviously a lot more. There's a lot listed in the book there, um, and we're going to talk about those. We're going to have a, an assignment about the personal traits of a good EMT. Um, as we said, professional appearances, it inspires confidence in, in people. Um, okay, so let's take a look at this. as a little thought experience, thought experiment. You've been arrested, right? Let's say you've been arrested and you've been charged for hom with homicide, right? And you're looking at doing 20 years. You're going to a federal penitentiary for 20 years for a crime that you did not commit. You are absolutely innocent here. Now, you've been given a court-appointed attorney, excuse me, and you haven't met them yet in person. You've not, not, had not met them yet. You haven't seen what they look like, okay? Now first time you see them is when they walk into the courtroom. Look at these two people. Which one of these, when you see them walk into this courtroom, which one of these two people uh, do you feel confident in that you're going to go home to your family, that you're not going to go to jail? Or which one walks into the courtroom and you're like, man, I'm, I'm going to jail. This person is not getting me off uh, these charges. 
for me personally, it's going to be the the professional looking lady on on the right there. Look, she's uh, she's professional in, in her appearance. She seems confident, right? Uh, all, all that she's portraying in just this simple picture tells me that um, that she's good at what she does just by looking at the picture. The first impression that I have. Now the other guy, hey, he's got stains on his shirt. You know, in a suit, he's untucked. Maybe that's some mustard, or I don't know. Did he have a powdered donut before he came in there? His briefcase, or stuff coming out. I don't even. Is that underwear coming out of his briefcase? What's he doing walking into court with that? Like that guy walks into court to defend me. I'm. I think I'm going to jail. Now this lady walks into court. I'm going home. Right. I feel like I'm going home. Now imagine an EMT walking into your home to take care of like your mom or grandma or you. Right. If uh, your EMT walks in, their shirt's untucked, they got a mustard stain on there, uh, you know, because they just had their uh, you know, quarter pound big bite for lunch on the way over and it dripped all over, right? Or you get somebody that walks into your house, their uniform looks good, their shirt's tucked in, um, it's not sloppy, it's not wrinkled, and all that kind of stuff. Like that person would project much more confidence. Um, I would take in that I would, uh, and uh, feel like I could be confident in them if they walked in with that, that appearance rather than slop being uh, slovenly. Um, so um, a good personal trait of the EMT is having that um, the pride to have professional uh, appearance uh, there. It actually does a lot. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get to nonverbal communication uh, things later on in, in the year. So some more personal traits of the EMT. Um, you've got to be a self-starter, and that starts here in this class. You, you're going to have to put in the work as an EMT. You're going to have to do it. Um, you're going to have to be emotionally stable. We go through a lot of stuff, and we'll talk about uh, stressors and uh, psychological stressors that we may encounter and come across, um, but it helps being emotionally stable to be able to handle some of the things that we have to do or see uh, there. You should be a leader, be able to lead. Uh, you should be neat and clean in appearance and you should be of good moral character and respectful uh, to others. Uh, bottom line is, um, you have to be able to be trusted to go into someone's home, a stranger's home, uh, and give them medical care. You have to be trusted with their personal and private medical information. Um, uh, there. And you have to be respectful uh, of them um, uh, and all, all that information you're getting. Um, basically, as an EMT, like, you want to think of your most beloved family member, whoever that may be, and every patient you come across, every single one, from your first to your last, you should treat that patient like your most beloved family member. Like no exceptions. It doesn't matter if somebody's in custody from the police and, you, and it's a bad guy. Like you have to give them the best possible care that you can. Uh, that's your job. Um, obviously, uh, you know, it's anybody that comes across your path, whether um, you have differences with them, whether it's political differences or uh, religious differences or whatever it might be, you've got to treat everybody like it's your most beloved family member. Um, you have to be, uh, show everybody that respect. Um, there. So there's some traits. Um, you need to be in control of your, your habits, uh, you know, don't be drinking on the job, don't be smoking in the back of the ambulance, you know, that kind of thing. Um, don't be on your phone, uh, that kind of stuff. You should be able to be controlled in your conversation and able to communicate properly. Being controlled means like, uh, you should be able to control your emotions when you're communicating. Um, you're going to get yelled at by people as an EMT, and you have to be able to communicate with them uh, calm level-headed, rational man at all times. Um, the ability to listen to others, to be an active listener, and we'll talk about active listening, um, is crucial. It is absolutely crucial, and we're going to help develop that tool this year. Um, you got to be non-judgmental and fair. We touched on that a little bit. you got to treat everybody as if they were your most beloved family member. Okay? You can't judge people for the situations that they're in or that life has bestowed upon them or Whatever it might be, um, non-judgmental and fair is absolutely the way to go. As far as education goes, um, we have an obligation to maintain up-to-date knowledge and skills. 
Um, can't just take your EMT class and forget about it if you're going to be in this industry. You have an obligation to um, may be up to date. You have to uh, take refresher courses. We have an obligation to do continuing education. Um, every, let's see, it's four years in uh, Virginia and three years for national registry. Um, you have to renew your certification and you have to do it by doing a certain amount of hours of continuing educa uh, education. You can get those online conferences, seminars, lectures, uh, all sorts of ways to be able to do that, but you have to maintain your education. It does not stop here once you get your certification. Um, and we'll talk about these. How are you going to maintain uh, uh, and stay current uh, once you're out of the classroom? What kind of qualities would you like to see? We already asked this, but what kind of qualities would you like to see in the EMT that's caring for you? And how do you get closer to being that kind of EMT? What is it going to take for you to um, work on or build those personal qualities that's going to help you? Whoops! It's going to help you become uh, a better EMT. All right, we touched on this a little bit earlier. But let's talk about the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians. Uh, it's registration. It's a registry for EMRs, EMTs, AEMTs, and paramedics who successfully complete their national registry exams. Um, we talked about reciprocity and how it helps you go from state to state or region to region. Um, and it's very beneficial when applying for employment. It's great to, to see that. You can say you're a nationally registered EMT. If uh, people don't know what it is, like, oh, that's fantastic. That sounds, that sounds really cool. And if people do know what it is, they're like, great, that's perfect. That's exactly what we want. Um, so it's very beneficial. Um, should you, we'll be starting accounts on there and everything. And uh, once you pass the tests for certification at the end of the year, you'll not only be a state of Virginia EMT, but you'll be a nationally registered EMT as well. Um, uh, once you turn 18, for those of you who aren't 18. Uh, quality improvement is a process of, of making our care better. Uh, we review um, uh, information, literature, and data from, uh, from calls. There are massive studies about um, treatment and things like that. It's identifying things that need to get better in our, in our delivery of patient care and then working on them. Okay. Um, it's, it's, there's always deficiencies. There's always places to get better. So quality improvement, QI or QA, quality assurance, um, it's the same thing basically. Um, it's all a process of getting better. How can we deliver the best possible patient care um, to our community? So everybody's got a good role. Everybody's got a role in an organization. So if you go out and you join, let's say, Waynesboro First Aid Crew, uh, there, everybody's got an, uh, a role. So when you're the EMT and you're in charge, you're going to be writing reports. You're going to be providing carefully written documentation, um, and uh, somebody's going to QA your uh, documentation. Um, uh, there, that that always happens. Um, getting feedback from patients or hospital staff helps. Uh, maintaining your equipment and, and knowing how to use it all, continuing education, all these things are part of. Quality improvement. All right, let's talk about medical direction a little bit uh, here. Um, all patient care in a region is performed under the direction of the medical director. As I said earlier, our medical director is in charge of all patient care in the EMS system. So all the pre-hospital care, care that's given to a patient before they get to the hospital. Um, it happens under the medical director's direction. So they're in charge of the protocols. What we can and cannot do as, as EMTs, um, the steps we take when somebody has this condition, oh, okay, they have this condition, then we can do A, B, then C. Um, they, they lay out our instructions for patient care, uh, obviously. They oversee training. So for example, our medical director, he has to sign off on this class. In order for us to have this class, our medical director has had to sign off on it say that yes this is what we want again they develop the treatment protocols they issue offline medical direction which is called standing orders so that basically that's like oh what do we do if a patient is uh, having a heart attack well one of the things I see here in our protocols for a patient has is having a heart attack is we give them aspirin okay 
patient's having a heart attack or chest pain, signs that they're having a heart attack, give them aspirin. I don't need to call anybody for that. I don't need to do anything. I'm just giving the patient aspirin. That's part of our protocols, and that's called a standing order. That's offline medical direction. It's just an order that's out there, right? Um, and it's part of our care. Or if somebody's um, oxygen level is below a certain percentage, we give them oxygen. It's just a standing order. It's called offline medical direction. It's just the rules of the road, basically. And there's also online medical direction. This is where you actually call a hospital and get a doctor um, on the line, right, on the phone line or whatever, and you say, hey, this is what my, is happening with my patient. I want to do this. Do you think that's right? Like if you're unsure. Um, uh, those of higher certification levels um, can, can give medications, uh, different medications, and some of them require permission to give them. Um, so uh, you may need to call the hospital and say, hey, my, my patient is having this medical condition. I see X, Y, and Z, and these are their vital signs. I would like to give this medication. The hospital comes back on the line, online medical direction, and say, okay, you are approved to give that medical, uh, that, that medicine to the patient. That's an online medical direction. You're gonna have to know the difference between offline medical direction, standing orders, and online medical direction. Make sure you know the difference. Uh, we have roles in public health. Uh, there's injury prevention from geriatric patients. Like I, remember, uh, like I mentioned, we moved the uh, little old ladies throw rugs out of the way so they wouldn't be a tripping um, hazard for her. Injury prevention for youth, public vaccination programs, disease uh, surveillance. Um, uh, nowadays, they're, they're doing um, uh, programs in which EMTs and paramedics will visit um, what are called frequent flyers, people that go to the hospital very often. They'll visit them once or maybe twice a week at their home to check in to make sure things are going well with them and um, so they don't need to continuously go to the hospital. Um, there's programs like that also. So we have, we have a massive role in the public health uh, sphere. Um, there's lots of research. You can become involved in research. There's uh, lots, of, lots of ways to uh, get involved with research and we'll touch on more of this when we're in class uh, there. Um, but what you should know is there's ways to access research. We all have. Sorry. Um, there's great ways to access research. We all have supercomputers, right, in our pockets, and we can access research um, uh, many ways and we can review literature uh, of what's going on. Like, if you want to know, like, man, um, why aren't we using. Uh, a nasopharyngeal airway more often it's, uh, than an oropharyngeal airway. There's benefits to, to using it that the OPA doesn't have. Well, there's literature out there on that. There's literature out there uh, suggesting more use of things. You can just go out there and look it up. And um, it's part of your continuing education uh, in, in a ways is that doing research. And again, you can uh, absolutely be part of it. A lot of the EMS systems are pilot programs. And so the state may say, you know what, we're going to try some, uh, something different when somebody is, is uh, in cardiac arrest. We're going to try giving this drug earlier or more, or we're going to try not giving this drug in this resuscitation attempt. And so you, you're uh, part of a pilot program and seeing what the data and the outcomes uh, suggest after uh, use or non-use of, of medications and things like that. So. There's lots of research that you can take part in. Um, all right, so that is our introduction to the EMS system uh, there. You know, we went quickly through here, um, but we just wanted to give you a quick taste of what's there. If you have any questions, obviously, please feel free to email me or obviously ask them in class. Um, next up, our uh, next chapter that we're going to be talking about is going to be um, uh, the well being of the EMT. So that'll be chapter two, and we'll tackle that next. All right, guys, so stop sharing my screen here, and we will, uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks.